Hey everyone, in this video I would like to show you my method of extracting heat from magma and turning it into power. Now this design extracts all, nearly all heat from the magma, both in, in its liquid state and in its solid state as igneous rock. And at the end of the process, the igneous rock is actually coming out at low temperature and can be used for construction. So let's start and explain what's going on here. So here we have our volcano, which is pretty straightforward. The magma is housed here. There's a mechanized airlock that controls magma flow into the first chamber. Now in the first chamber, magma is touching metal tiles as it drops and transferring heat into the steam chamber where the turbines uh, take the steam and convert it into power. So as the magma loses heat, it will eventually turn into igneous rock, it, its solid state. So at this point, this second mechanized airlock via automation will open and drop the igneous rock into the second chamber. And at this point, the igneous rock is still burning hot at 1.4K degrees, and we still have some heat to extract from this igneous rock. And the way I chose to deal with this and extract the heat is by using conveyor rails. A sweeper and a uh, loader um, sweeps the igneous rock into a conveyor loop and takes the igneous rock through the steam chamber in a closed loop. So as the igneous rock uh, traverses into the, in, inside the steam chamber in a closed loop, it transfers heat. And we know that the steam turbines operate at maximum efficiency when their steam is at around 200 degrees Celsius. So our goal is to keep the igneous rock in the loop as long as its uh, temperature is uh, just above 200 degrees. Once its temperature is cold enough at around the barrier of 200 degrees, we want to pull it out of the loop and insert the new igneous rock into the loop. Now, no new igneous rock uh, will enter the loop until the old ones will uh, exit. This is how we uh, extract all the possible heat from uh, the igneous rock in every given loop. So this process was just happening. Uh, the old igneous rock got cold enough. It was at around 200 degrees and it entered the final cooling chamber. This is where we um, cool the igneous rock from around 200 degrees to usable temperature uh, at around 50, 60 degrees. The cooling chamber is uh, compromised of two parts. The first part are a uh, few rows of window tiles and the other part is just uh, filled with hydrogen and some whiz words. So uh, both, of the, both of those uh, sections are uh, co cooled by uh, radiant pipes and a cooling system, which we will explain in a moment. And at the end of the day, if we speed up the process a bit, the igneous, uh, the igneous rock arrives at around 38 uh, degrees Celsius, which is, of course, very viable for construction. So this is the entire process in a nutshell. Okay, now let's talk about uh, the machinery and the uh, bits and pieces that make this entire design work. So here we have our first, ch our first chamber. So as magma turns into igneous rock, there is a slight possibility that uh, it can turn into a tile and not the debris form of an igneous rock. So if that happens by some random chance or I don't know what, we have a robo miner on standby to mine up this tile. Generally, it doesn't happen, so this robo miner is idle, but we have a backup just in case the game decides to screw us up. At the bottom chamber, we have our auto sweeper and loader, which I probably previously said are loading up the igneous rock into the rails. Now, both of them are sitting in vacuum, and since they both generate heat during their uh, operation, we need to find a way to cool them down, otherwise they will overheat and stop working. Now, to cool stuff in a vacuum, I came up with a nice and simple contraption. There is a row of components over here. At the bottom we have a mini liquid pump. It is uh, placed in some liquid, doesn't really matter much. I chose the petroleum because I like the color yellow. And after uh, actually one time in a cy cycle, just for a few brief moments, this pump is pumping some liquid and is dropping it right over this robo miner. The water is concentrated on this tile and then transfers heat with the robo miner and afterwards it drops back into the pool. The exact same idea, although a bit different, I've used to cool out the sweepers. Now this conveyor loader is one tile apart from the mini liquid pump. There's a reason for this. As liquid drops from the tile, it drops onto the adjacent uh, row. 
if it touches by some means, by some reason, the conveyor rails that has this igneous rock at uh, 1.4 K temperature, they will exchange heat and everything is going to boil to hell. So this is why the, the gap here. So the falling liquid will not interact with the hot rails. So those liquids that we're using to cool down the machinery, they're going to get uh, heated up by themselves because they transfer heat from the machinery into themselves. And a simple solution to cool them is simply pass, to pass some radiant pipes through the pools uh, with some coolant from, that comes out from an equitoner uh, cooling system. So that's about it. Let's move into another uh, interesting and important bit. Now remember that I told you that we need a system that controls the temperature on the conveyor rails, right? If they get uh, cold enough, we divert them into the third room. Now, as you might know, as of this video, we don't have a conveyor rail temperature sensor. So I had to improvise one for myself. So here's how it works. I've created a two tile little little chamber and I filled it with a small amount of hydrogen gas. The rails, uh, the outgo outgoing rails from the steam chamber are passing through this little chamber. Now, since there's just a small amount of hydrogen, it is very sensitive to temperature changes because its mass is very low. So every time igneous rock passes through the hydrogen, it shifts its temperature. We measure the temperature of the hydrogen with a thermosensor. This thermosensor is then indirectly gives us the temperature on the rails. Obviously with some error, but it gets the job done and the error is not really a problem. Now this thermosensor then feeds it, its signal into the conveyor uh, shutoff, which redirects the igneous rock either back into the, steam into the steam chamber when it is currently turned off or into the third chamber, the cooling chamber, when it is turned on. All right, so let's lastly talk about the cooling system. So the cooling system is your typical aqua tuner loop in combination with a steam turbine. I've added some liquid, liquid reservoirs to prevent, to prevent traffic jumps with uh, coolant waiting in line for cooling or passing through the uh, cooling loop. Basically what's happening is that coolant leaving the first reservoir is being checked by a thermal sensor for its temperature. If it's cold enough, it will, it will go back into the cooling loop, but if it's not, it will go into the aqua tuner for cooling. So we use the cooling system for three main objectives. The first one is to cool the room with the steam turbines. The second one is to cool the liquid, which we use to cool the machines in vacuum. And the third one we are, going to, we are using to cool the third room with the wizards and the glass tiles. Okay, let's talk about the automation. Now, the, the majority of the automation that is going on is regarding the control of the, both of the airlocks. So let's split it up into three parts and see what's going on. The input to the automation comes from three sensors. Two hydro sensors in the magma chamber and one sensor in the steam chamber. Okay, let's talk about the mechanized airlock that governs magma flow. This airlock is fed by an end gate. An end gate is a logic gate that outputs a green signal only if both of its inputs are also green in their, uh, in their color. So the right input comes from the right hydrosensor. The right hydrosensor measures magma in the chamber. If there is an amount of magma that is less than 200 kilograms, this hydrosensor will output green, although it's going to be delayed by a filter gate. The reason for the delay will come in a moment. On the left side, we have the thermosensor, which measures the temperature in the steam chamber. If it senses that the temperature is below 200 degrees Celsius, it will output red. This red will be converted through a NOT gate into green, and it will be then fed into the end gate. The big picture is, is that if the steam chamber is cold enough and there is no magma, both of those will input green and magma will flow. So the idea behind the feedback of temperature from the steam chamber is that because magma is not our only source of heat here, we can also use the igneous rock in the loop to heat up the steam, even without the help of the magma. So as long as the igneous rock provides enough heat to keep the temperature up, we don't need to put additional magma, we don't need to overkill the temperature in the chamber, 
so we keep the gate closed using this feedback. Next up, let's talk about the other mechanized airlock that drops the igneous rock and about the interaction between them. So we know that we want to drop uh, igneous rock into the lower chamber, but we also have lava dropping from the upper mechanized airlock. We really don't want them to operate at the same time because this can result in magma dropping all the way into the lower chamber and this will mess everything up. You probably remember that filter gate I told you earlier. This is exactly its purpose. This filter gate gives 50 seconds delay, 15 seconds delay uh, for this mechanized airlock to open. This gives just enough time for the bottom mechanized airlock to drop its igneous rock and close. And only then lava is dropped into the chamber. Now notice that I also said the door needs to open and then quickly close all by itself. So to accomplish this goal, we are going to use a memory toggle. Now, the way the memory toggle works is as follows. Let's say all the, all the legs are red. If I output a green signal into the memory toggle while the reset port is at red, I will get a green signal in the output. If I will turn off this green signal and switch it to, and switch it to red, and at the same time keep the reset port at red, then it will still output green. It remembers the last, the last uh, green light it, uh, it received. This is where the memory comes from in the word memory toggle. The only way to reset the output back to red is by activating the reset port. By activating, it means giving it a green signal. We are going to use this function to accomplish our goal with the door. The left sensor is also measuring magma in the chamber, but this one is set to zero. This means that if there is no magma sitting on top of this sensor, it must mean all the magma has been converted into igneous rock. This gives the trigger for the doors to open. Both the reset port and the input of the memory toggle are fed with the same sensor. The input is fed immediately without any delays. The moment the sensor turns to green, the memory token will also out in output green. The reset port is also fed, but with a delay. The delay is 5 seconds. This means that the door will remain open for 5 seconds because the reset port has not been yet activated. It is being delayed and after 5 seconds, the reset port will get its green light and the memory toggle will go back to red and close the door. The nutshell here is that the door will open up for 5 seconds, drop the igneous rock, and then close. Okay, for the third part, let's go over the rest of the automation. This, uh, the thermo sensor is also connected to this mechanized airlock. It simply allows heat transfer between the steam chamber and the liquid magma. If this door is open, there will be no transfer of heat. If it is closed, like right now, there will be a transfer of heat. Next up, we have the clock controlling the pumps. Remember, once in a cycle, those pumps get activated and pump some liquid on top of the machinery. Sensor connecting to the conveyor shutoffs. Uh, we have steam turbines being controlled by a battery connected in the domain uh, power grid and the thermo sensors controlling uh, liquid shutoffs. This is basically the entire automation of this design. Okay, lastly, let's talk about the efficiency of the steam turbines. Uh, by efficiency, I simply mean that how well can those turbines run without any input of magma for a very long time. Uh, a very long time means when the volcano goes dormant. So this volcano has been dormant for 70 cycles now, and only three cycles ago, it entered an active state, and it, it is still counting 10 cycles into its first eruption. So during this time, those steam turbines were feeding off this uh, igneous rock left up uh, from the previous activation cycle of the volcano. And notice that I'm not even close of going through all that material. Still around 71 tons of igneous rock to go. That igneous rock alone has enough heat to keep the steam chamber at around 175 to 180 degrees Celsius which is enough to keep the steam turbines going in the green. Okay, so what I could have done better here is to add at least one more steam turbine because I have just so much material to go through. 
And I think three storm turbines would have been optimal, which is fairly easy to implement. Uh, you can just extend this chamber to the left a bit and the steam chamber and you're good to go. So in general, this uh, design has a very uh, high longevity, even through dormancy, long dormancy periods of the volcano. So that's everything about the design. Let's move on about how to construct everything from scratch. Okay, so first thing is regarding materials. We have two main materials we're going to use throughout this design. That would be wolframite and its uh, product tungsten. Tungsten is produced directly out of wolframite. This is going to be uh, used for its high melting point to prevent lava from melting wires, logic gates, and all kinds of stuff that is going to touch. And the next, uh, the, this next bit is igneous rock. We are going to use igneous rock to build all the insulated tiles and all insulated stuff in general. Ceramics can also work, but ceramics, uh, you're going to need a lot of it and you need to produce them. So if you don't have uh, available stock, uh, when you start building it, just go for igneous rock. It works just fine. So this design is 29 structures high, 32, st 32 tiles uh, wide. So this is the skeleton, which you should be starting off. Um, note that the this is the magma chamber. This is the first chamber with uh, a robo miner and this one without a sweeper. They are currently connected and all of them should be in total vacuum. Now, uh, the, other, uh, the other rooms, the one with the turbines is going to be right here. The steam is going to sit around here and uh, the hydrogen is going to sit around here. I recommend uh, putting vacuum inside of them because uh, you can then pump pure hydrogen, um, but uh, it's not really a problem. Uh, even if you have some oxygen left in the uh, turbine room and in the hydrogen room, it's not going to affect the cooling a lot, so the vacuum here is not mandatory. The only mandatory vacuum is the magma chamber and both machinery. Okay, so once you have this thing uh, completed, the main skeleton, you can basically just plug parts now. So let's start with some steam turbines. We have three of them. One goes over here. The second one, the third one in the main room. We have some uh, farm tiles for wizards. Now regarding the power station, I've read on the forums and sites that um, it it is, seems to be currently bugged that you can't really tune up steam turbines, it just doesn't work. Uh, in this case, until it gets fixed, you can just slap more uh, uh, wizards over here. Once it gets fixed, you can just replace both of them with the power station and boost your turbines. So this is flexible. Uh, next, we have uh, some um, liquid vents. One is going to be uh, right under the turbine's um, output. We're going also to use some over here. Doesn't matter which material, those ones aren't going to interact with anything hot. Let's place our automation. Uh, our, let's replace our components. The machinery for the, um, for the side rooms. So we have a robo miner, a sweeper. And we have the pumps, I think, yeah. One over here, one over there. A tile. Um, it can be either airflow tile or normal tile, just no mesh tiles. Mesh tiles won't work because we need the, the liquid to stop on those tiles before dropping. Oh, so that's the second one. We also need a clock. And let's see what else. Okay, so we go with the aqua tuner. Uh, I still recommend the aqua tuner to be out of gold uh, amalgam. Uh, this is the part. It's not. It's not necessary, but if you have access to steel, uh, it would always be nice because um, gold is also nice. But uh, steel is always nice to have on aqua tuners just in case. But gold amalgam just works fine. So I'm just gonna slap it right here along with its liquid shut off. Like this, see, yes, let's like that. And then we have our liquid reservoirs, one, two. In between we have our sensors. I'm just plugging the parts right now. We will deal with the connections later. Just putting everything in its place. Okay. All right, let's plug our uh, improvised sensor, so we have a thermosensor over here, a ventilation va gas vent, 
uh, over here. Before you close this off, make sure you have a, a pipe a connection coming out so you can later uh, pump some gas into it. Once this is done, you can safely close this off. You're not going to need it. Over here, we're going to have our uh, conveyor shut off with a white arrow pointing up. Now, this thing uh, don't produce any heat, so they can't melt. They can't overheat. Matter of fact, you can drop them into lava and nothing will happen to them. Okay, so this is it. Um, actually, you might want to leave this open because you, you're going to build conveyors through this. So let's keep it open for now. And what else? Oh, we have a liquid vent missing around here. Um, a pump. Called a magalgam pump should be fine. Now this pump is going to help us create a vacuum. The reason why we want to create a vacuum between the chamber with the aqua tuner and the outside is because the only way that heat can escape from this chamber is through this heavy joint plate. And since I'm going to feed this aqua tuner directly from the main power grid with a heavy watt wire, I am forced to use joint plates and those transfer heat. So if you isolate the, the, them in a vacuum, they cannot transfer it so, and not boil your base. So this is the point of this pipe. We're going to plug an Atmos sensor over here. Talking about sensors, we have like uh, two of them, three of them. So we have one over here. And two of them in the lava room right here. Okay, the, this is important. I even, even I overlooked it. Those sensors, okay, must be made either with tungsten or steel. They are going to be in direct touch with lava, so make sure we don't need them to. We don't want them to melt. So I'm going to make both of them from tungsten, since it's easily it easily more obtainable than steel. Okay, let's uh, look if we uh, missed something. Ah, okay. We, so we need to add over here um, the conveyor loader now 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 this is important the way you place it is important make sure you turn it around upside down and then place it not adjacent to the pump one tile away the reason is out of this conveyor loader comes extremely hot material remember the igneous rock and as this thing cools down the liquid comes down from this uh, row if it comes in touch with any of the rails then it's going to interact with the igneous rock and uh, it will interchange heat and everything is going to boil. We don't want that. So this way uh, they are not going to interact. So this orientation is very, very important. Don't miss this. Next we have our... Um, there's a sweeper here as well. This, this doesn't matter which one I made of. This room is fairly cool. The receptacle is over here. Uh, we then have two storage bins, one for igneous rock, the other one for phosphorus, phosphorite, so uh, the auto sweeper can also automatically feed our waste walls. Just gonna dump him over here. And I think the last one is just uh, a ba smart batteries for power control. So I'm just gonna dump some of them uh, with the design I like to use. Um, now there's a transformer over here. Shut off a battery. And basically what's happening is the main uh, line is being fed from this place, going through the sh shutoff. Conductive wires. I like to use conductive wires, but I think this circuit um, might not even reach the 1K watt, just all components. So normal wires might, might be fine, but I like to use conductive wires. At this point of the game, you usually have plenty of refined stuff to work with. But normal wires, normal wires will work fine. And I think this is about, about it regarding components. Okay, so I think it's time to start plugging our uh, systems. Let's start with power. So at the heavy side, we have the heavy watt wire. And it's, it, this is going to feed our pump. And our sensor, not sensor, the liquid, the liquid valve and the aqua tuner. It will also branch into the steam turbines and it will also go into the other steam, tur other steam turbines. Now what I like to do, this is not necessary, but I like to plug uh, two, auto sweeper, two auto sweepers here. And ju just, just so they can um, feed the wastewater, I put a conveyor receptacle between them. 
And then I just pump some uh, uh, phosphorus uh, via conveyor rails into this into this chamber. Okay, so the main power line comes from this from this section. Now on the low side, we start off with uh, let's say conductive wires. So the first station is this liquid valve. We then go in and feed the auto sweeper. Conveyor shut off. The components of the bottom chamber, all the way up into the upper chamber, and this is important. Now the mechanized airlock that is going to sit here must be fed with electricity because we want it to open fast and closed fast to, to improve the precision of magma dropping. And since magma is going to be dropping here, make sure that this section of the wire is made out of tungsten. We could go to get away with iron up, up until now because this wire doesn't really touch anything dangerous, but the magma must be um, the wire that touched the magma must be done with tungsten. So there's our tungsten conductive wire, and this is pretty much the entire electricity done. Okay, so let's start with the rails. Now you probably noticed that there is an overabundance of bridges when we previewed the rail system in the start of the video. Unfortunately, there's a good reason for this. You see there is currently a very nasty bug as of the making of this video which causes rails to, 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 to not transfer heat when you're not looking at them. It, it may sound stupid, but it actually just works like that. In order to solve this bug, we need to include the uh, bridges that every time the rails are crossing between mediums. So this is exactly what I'm going to do. So make sure you add any, every one of these bridges because every one of them is important. I'm going to make the rails and bridges out of wolframite because they're going to transport hot materials burning igneous rocks and we don't want them to melt so this is why I'm choosing wolframite so let's start with placing the bridges first both of those bridges serving for the purpose of creating the loop and the priority of the loop the rest of the bridges are going to help us solve the annoying bug so one goes here another one goes there then we have one here and the last one is going to be over here so those are all the bridges we need all made with wolframite. Next up, let's connect the rails. So we are going to do this um, as follows in the screen. Now uh, from here we go into our loop, just like that, looping around the steam chamber, looping back, then we go into the conveyor shut off, now from the conveyor shutoff we go into the last bridge and now we create the loop for the cooling room. So it goes like this to be as efficient as possible. And we're almost done. There we go. Once again all the rails have been made with wolframite and that covers the rail system. Okay, the next part is automation. So let's plug the automation circuit and in the same heartbeat, we can also set up the sensors to the correct value. So for the automation, I recommend using a tungsten to make the gates since some of them are going to be touching lava. Um, not, they don't take a lot of material, so just in case, I recommend just building everything out of tungsten in case you forgot to switch between of them. So, you know, just to be sure. So let's start off with our end gate. I'm going to place the gates first and then connect everything together. That's not an end gate, that's an end gate. Made out of tungsten. Going over here. We have our memory toggle, toggle once again made from tungsten. Going like this. We have a node gate, tungsten. Over here. And we have two filter gates, once again from tungsten. One is going right here, the other one just below, over here. Okay, okay. so let's plug the wires. I'm going to use uh, tungsten once again because some of those wires are going to be in direct contact, contact with lava. So I started off with a memory toggle. It's going to connect to our future mechanized airlock. We're going to make a bridge 
over here. Connect the right sensor into the first buffer, into the end gate. Output of the end gate into our future mechanized airlock. Not gate going into the uh, end gate, on the other side into the sensor. Afterwards, we also have our mechanized airlock over here, which I accidentally deleted for some reason. We are going to get one wire into the door. Uh, what else? Okay, we need to plug the left sensor, just one wire running across. Uh, output of the second filter gate into the reset port and the bridge into the input port of the memory toggle. Um, yeah, so that's about the core circuit of, of the design. Okay, so let's plug the remaining stuff. We have our automation wire from the clock. Uh, this wire doesn't have to be from, from tungsten because it doesn't touch anything hot. And next we have uh, this sensor connected to the conveyor shutoff. Our turbines, well, it's not, it's not necessary, but I like to control my turbines using a, a, a battery. Sensors connected into the shutoffs. And I think that's pretty much all the automation. Okay, so let's finish up with uh, tuning the sensors. So the first hydro sensor on the right is set to 200 kilograms below. The left one is on zero kilogram below. The clock is set to zero activation time and half percent active duration. The thermo sensor in the steam chamber is on 200 degrees and above. The thermo sensor on the rails is 210 and below. The extra 10 degrees is to accommodate for the error. The liquid pipe thermo sensors should have the same value and I set them to 20%. This means uh, the liquid output of the aqua tuner. So it will, if you set to uh, 20 degrees, the aqua tuner will try to uh, set this temperature of the outgoing coolant. And finally, this uh, atmos sensor is going to be set to zero and above in order to create vacuum in this chamber. So that's all the sensor tuning. Okay, next up, piping. So we start off with an insulated liquid pipe made out of igneous rock, going into the sensor and the liquid shutoff from the left liquid reservoir. Now, if the liquid is not cold enough, it goes into the right reservoir and into the cooling loop of the aqua tuner. That cooling loop is connected in this manner and the liquid enters with this bridge. Now, if it is cool enough, then it exits from the shutoff and enters this bridge. In time, cooled liquid from the aqua tuner also enters the bridge. And both of these bridges converge into one single pipe. In the meantime, we can also connect the output of the turbines into their corresponding vents. Okay, so from here, we enter the turbine chamber and switch to radiant pipes in order to encourage heat transfer. We use bridges to pass over the pipe going out of the turbine and start snaking. And at the end of, of the snake, we go back into insulated liquid pipes and proceed into the next part. This is going to be the pool where we cool our liquids. So we go like this. At this section, I'm going to again switch to radiant pipe. And into the second cooling chamber. Once again, radiant pipes. All right, then we pipe back. And the next stop is the cooling chamber for the igneous rock. Once again, I'm switching into radiant pipes and snaking around. Just like this. At the end of the snake, I'm going to switch to insulated pipe and draw it all the way into the entrance, the input of the left liquid reservoir. 
and with this our piping is complete well uh, we also need to connect our small pumps there we go there's no need for insulated pipes okay we now build temp shift plates so for the steam chamber i highly recommend using diamond because we want a good heat transfer and a good reading from the sensor so diamond it is uh, granite can also work uh, but i still recommend diamond for this for the rest of the um, rooms the steam turbines and the cooling room granite is just fine it's fairly cheap easy to come by so just use granite and just make a nice layer of temp shift plates same goes into the cooling room but i will only fill it up until the last four tiles there we go the last four tiles we're going to cover with glass and um, with window tiles to be precise made out of diamond because diamond is the best uh, conductor it has an excellent heat thermal conductivity uh, this is why we're using it it also looks pretty nice so that's about temp shift plates and the glass tiles. Okay, it is time to wrap up by closing uh, spaces and filling up the required uh, gases and liquids into the respective places. So let's start by closing our, um, our rooms. So we're closing our sensors and conveyor, our aqua tuner, our vacuum chamber over here. Uh, we're going to use our mechanized airlocks finally this is important make sure you make them out of wolframite or steel otherwise lava can melt them so wolframite it is cheaper than steel easier to come by okay let's see if i missed anything else doesn't look like it let's plug some whiz warts as well there we go there are there are the whiz warts and now we also need to close the steam chamber and fill everything with the corresponding materials okay so i've filled the required mediums water goes into the steam chamber in the future it will turn into steam water goes into the aquatino chamber hydrogen goes into the cooling chamber hydrogen goes into the turbine chamber uh, i've also added an output uh, vent to our vacuum pipe over here i've also forgot some whiz bolts actually there we go. Those two wizards are enough to destroy all the heat generated by, by, the steam, by this uh, steam turbine. Okay, so last but not least, we need to fill the chamber with our improvised rail sensor with a bit of hydrogen. So remember, we left ourselves some pipe to work with. Uh, the way I recommend doing this is by using a mini gas, mini gas pump. Find yourself a nice pocket of hydrogen and pump a few packets once you have like four or five packets immediately disconnect the pipe and that should be enough uh, hydrogen remember you don't want a lot of hydrogen here as little as possible and with this uh, the design is set up and ready to go and accept magma once you plug it into your main power grid set up the conveyors and that's about it all right so that's my version of the so-called volcano tamer with a little extra of filling you to the brim with igneous rock which you can use to fulfill your wildest insulation dreams and yeah uh, i would really like to hear what you think about it if you have any feedback ideas questions feel free to post them in the comments below and if that video was helpful for you please leave a like and yeah thanks for watching and i'll see you next time